Good morning, class. Today I'm going to be recording jury charge. So let me give you some proper names that come out on your speed building. You have assault and battery. You have legislature. You have female, rape, accomplishment. You have um, sexual intercourse. So let me write some of these down for you. So assault and battery. I write S-A-U-B, sob. And it, oh, it, it does come out for you all. Okay, sob. And then you have um, female is F-A-E-L, female. This is a little tough. Sufficient, S-U-F. You have um, describe as drive. You have accomplishment, plishment, plishment. You have um, requirement, R long I R M T, requirement. You have carnal, it's just K A R N L, carnal, K A R N L. And then you have sexual intercourse, swars. S W long U R S. Okay. And this is going to be 160 jury charge for five minutes, you all. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the indictment now embraces those offenses of assault and battery of a very high and aggravated nature. Obviously, if you conclude the state satisfied you of any offense in this category, then the defendant party. These are alternative offenses. Again, the defendant party could only be found guilty of one offense within this category, either the principal offense of rape or the lesser included of assault with intent to ravish, or the third lesser included of assault of a high and aggravated nature. First, then, defining the offense of rape. The legislature of the state has enacted a statute which basically simply restated the common law, our traditional law on the subject in this language. Whosoever shall ravish a woman when she did not consent either before or after or ravished a woman with force shall be deemed guilty of rape. The word ravish and the word rape as used in the statute are synonymous terms. Both describe the same offense and that offense is the unlawful taking of carnal knowledge of a woman forcibly and without her consent. The words carnal knowledge means the same thing as sexual intercourse. Consequently, the offense of rape is the accomplishment unlawfully that is without lawful right or authority, and this would concur if the other elements of the offense are made out, the elements of force and absence of consent. Rape, then, is the unlawful accomplishment of sexual intercourse, male against female, forcibly and without the consent of the female. Now, there obviously cannot be carnal knowledge unless there is a penetration of the male organ into the female organ. Proof of any penetration, however slight, would be sufficient to make up this element of the offense. Carnal knowledge is accomplished by penetration. The state does not have to prove as an element of the offense any emission of semen. There must, however, be an actual penetration to the extent of the male organ into the sexual or genital female organ, but penetration, however slight, would be sufficient. Now then, the further elements of such acts of sexual intercourse or having of carnal knowledge should be shown to exist. The further elements then to make out the offense are the following. That such act of carnal knowledge or sexual intercourse was accomplished by force and without the consent of the female and against her will. In order then to constitute rape, the carnal knowledge must have been accomplished by force on the part of the male sufficient to overcome resistance offered by the female. Mere accusations on the part of the female would be insufficient. Proof of actual resistance is sufficient to a conviction of the offense unless it be shown that a female was either incapable by reason of some present physical condition of resisting or unless it be shown that she yielded herself through reasonable apprehension of imminent and serious bodily harm induced by threat or threats or show a force on the part of the male. The importance then of resistance by the female person is to show the use of force by the male and the element of non-consent 
on the part of the female. The sufficiency of resistance must be offered, of course, and be judged in the light of the surrounding circumstances as you find those to be such as the relative strength and position of the party's age, physical conditions, and what you find to be any degree of force to have been manifested or used in the way of threat of exertion of force by the male person. In the law, a female need not resist until her strength or consciousness is gone. The requirement of resistance by her would be satisfied when her conduct has been such as to make her non-consent and her actual resistance manifest or her status being that of being overcome by threat or show of force on the part of the male. Summarizing then, the offense of rape consists basically of three elements, three things of fact. First, the occurrence of the act of carnal knowledge, act of sexual intercourse. Secondly, that force was used by the defendant to accomplish that purpose. And third, that this was done without the consent and over the resistance of the female or that her resistance was overcome by reasonable apprehension of serious bodily harm, induced by threat or show of force on the part of the male. In order then for the state to be entitled to a verdict of guilty of that offense, you must conclude and be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant party was present and that he did commit that offense as defined to you by the accomplishment of sexual intercourse, the having of carnal knowledge of the female by the use of force and over her consent, that is without her consent. Further commit, commenting on the element then of force in the commission of the offense, the law refers by this element to such force as is sufficient to overcome the resistance of the female person. The required force then is that by which a dissect, dissenting female is subjected to and put under the power of the male so that he is able, notwithstanding her lack of consent or opposition, to have sexual intercourse with her. Such force in the law may be either actual occurrence of physical violence or constructive force, the degree of force and the degree of resistance being elements to be found by you from your judgment of the circumstances of the case. Okay, and so we have um, some words on the part is O-E-P-T, on the part, O-E-P-T. This is Danette. Consciousness is K-O-R-B-S and then N-S, asterisk. Consciousness. You have, this is tough, you all. Um, serious bodily harm is barm? No. Because serious bodily injury is S-B-O-J, so I don't know why you couldn't do S-B-S-B-A-R-M. I would enter that for serious bodily harm. Uh, you have surrounding. Surround the word is bound. B-O-U-N-D, come back G. Bound, come back G. You have organ. Don't forget to put the asterisk in, okay? Or put the asterisk in. You gotta put the asterisk in or it won't come out. I think it separates it. Cause or is, uh, that's how you write or. You have accomplished is plish, come back final D. P-L-I-R-B, come back final D. Ravished, so rav-ish, and then E, T asterisk. Okay, like that. And then you've got, let me give you one more. I just saw something. Um, legislature is legislate, L-E-G-T, sure. K-H-U-R, legislate, K-H-U-R. And then you have one more. Um, synonymous is non mus Yes, non mus and this is going to be at 170. I was a little fast on that last one, okay? This is 170. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this indictment now embraces those offenses of assault and battery of a very high and aggravated nature. Obviously, if you conclude the state satisfied you of any offense in this category, then the defendant party there are alternative offenses, again, 
the defendant party could only be found guilty of one offense within this category, either the principal offense of rape or the lesser included of assault with intent to ravish, or the third lesser included of assault of a high and aggravated nature. First then, defining the offense of rape, the legislature of the state has enacted a statute which basically simply restated the common law, our traditional law, on the subject in this language. Whosoever shall ravish a woman when she did not consent either before or after, or ravish the, a woman with force shall be deemed guilty of rape. The word ravish, the word rape as used in the statute are synonymous terms. Both describe the same offense and that offense is the unlawful taking of carnal knowledge of a woman forcibly and without her consent. The words carnal knowledge means the same thing as sexual intercourse. Consequently, the offense of rape is the accomplishment unlawfully that is without lawful right or authority and this would occur if the other elements of the offense are made out, the elements of force and absence of consent. Rape, then, is the unlawful accomplishment of sexual intercourse male against female forcibly and without the consent of the female. Now, there obviously cannot be carnal knowledge unless there is a penetration of the male organ into the female organ. Proof of any penetration, however slight, would be sufficient to make out this element of the offense. Carnal knowledge is accomplished by penetration. The state does not have to prove as an element of the offense any emission of semen. There must be, however, an actual penetration to some extent of the male organ into the sexual or genital female organ, but penetration, however slight, would be sufficient. Now then, the further elements of such act of sexual intercourse or having of carnal knowledge be shown to exist, the further elements then to make out the offense are the following, that such act of carnal knowledge or sexual intercourse was accomplished by force and without the consent of the female and against her will. In order then to constitute rape, the carnal knowledge must have been accomplished by force on the part of the male sufficient to overcome resistance offered by the female. Mere accusation on the part of the female would be insufficient. Proof of actual resistance is sufficient to a conviction of the offense unless it be shown that a female was either incapable by reason of some present physical condition of resisting or unless it be shown that she yielded herself through reasonable apprehension of imminent and serious bodily harm induced by threat or threats or, or show of force on the part of the male. The importance then of resistance by the female person is to show the use of force by the male and the element of non-consent on the part of the female. The sufficiency of resistance offered must of course be judged in the light of the surrounding circumstances as you find those to be, such as the relative strength and position of the parties, age, physical conditions, and what have you to find any degree of force to have been manifested or used in the way of threat of exertion by force by the male person. In the law, a female need not resist until her strength or consciousness is gone. The requirement of resistance by her would be satisfied when her conduct has been such as to make her non-consent and her actual resistance manifest or her status being that of being overcome by threat or show of force on the part of the male. Summarizing then, the offense of rape consists basically of three elements, three things of fact. First, the occurrence of the act of carnal knowledge, the act of sexual intercourse. Secondly, that force was used by the defendant to accomplish that purpose. And third, that this was done without the consent and over the resistance of the female, or that her resistance was overcome by reasonable apprehension of serious bodily harm, induced by threat or show of force on the part of the male. In order then for the state to be entitled to a verdict of guilty of that offense, you must conclude and be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant party was present and that he did commit that offense as defined to you by the accomplishment of sexual intercourse, the having of carnal knowledge of the female by the use of force and over her consent, that is without her consent. Further commenting on the element then of force in the commission of the offense, the law refers by this element to such force as is sufficient to overcome the resistance of the female person. The required force then is that by which a dissenting or dissenting female is subjected to and, and so dissenting you all is dis, C-I-S, sent, come back G, dissenting, okay? Um, You've got commission, K-M-I-G-S, K-M-I-G-S. 
Resistance, resistance is one way. Resistance. You've got apprehension, apprehension. A P H E N G S. Occurrence is O currents, K U R N S, O by itself. And then you have penetration is penetration, two strokes, P E N, tration. Imminent, I M N E N T, imminent, two strokes. And then you have genital. Gentel, J-E-N-T-A-L. And this is going to be at 180. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this indictment now embraces those offenses of assault and battery of a very high and aggravated nature. Obviously, if you conclude the state satisfied you of any offense in this category, then the defendant party, these are alternative offenses. Again, the defendant party could only be found guilty of one offense within this category, either the principal offense of rape or the lesser included of assault with intent to ravish, or the third lesser included of assault of a high and aggravated nature. First then, defining the offense of rape, the legislature of the state has enacted a statute which basically simply restated the common law, our traditional law on the subject of this language. Whosoever shall ravish a woman when she did not consent either before or after or ravished a woman with force shall be deemed guilty of rape. The word ravish, the word rape as used in the statute are synonymous terms, both describe the same offense, and that offense is the unlawful taking of carnal knowledge of a woman forcibly and without her consent. The words carnal knowledge means the same thing as sexual intercourse. Consequently, the offense of rape is the accomplishment unlawfully, that is without lawful right or authority, and this would occur if the other elements of the offense are made out, the elements of force and absence of consent. Rape then is the unlawful accomplishment of sexual intercourse male against female forcibly and without the consent of the female. Now there obviously cannot be carnal knowledge unless there is a penetration of the male organ into the female organ. Proof of any penetration, however slight, would be sufficient to make out this element of the offense. Carnal knowledge is accomplished by penetration. The state does not have to prove as an element of the offense any emission of semen. There must be, however, an actual penetration to some extent of the male organ into the sexual or genital female organ, but penetration, however slight, would be sufficient. Now then, the further elements of such acts of knowledge or sexual intercourse or having of carnal knowledge be shown to exist, the further elements then to make out the offense are the following that such act of carnal knowledge or sexual intercourse was accomplished by force and without the consent of the female and against her will. In order then to constitute rape, the carnal knowledge must have been accomplished by force on the part of the male sufficient to overcome resistance offered by the female. Mere accusation on the part of the female would be insufficient. Proof of actual resistance is sufficient to a conviction of the offense unless it be shown that a female was either incapable by reason of some present physical condition of resisting or unless it be shown that she yielded herself through reasonable apprehension of imminent and serious bodily harm induced by threat or threats or show of force on the part of the female. The importance then of resistance by the female person is to show the use of force by the female or the male and the element of non-consent on the part of the female. The sufficiency of resistance offered must of course be judged in the light of the surrounding circumstances as you find those to be such as the relative strength and the position of the parties, age, physical conditions, and what you find to be any degree of force to have been manifested or used in the way of threat of exertion of force by male person. In the law, a female need not resist until her strength or consciousness is gone. The requirement of resistance by her would be satisfied when her conduct has been such as to make her non-consent and her actual resistance manifest or her status being that of being overcome by threat or show of force on the part of the male. Summarizing then, the offense of rape consists basically of three elements, three things of fact. First, the occurrence of the act of carnal knowledge, act of sexual intercourse. Secondly, that force was used by the defendant to accomplish that purpose. And third, that this was done without the consent and over the resistance of the female or that her resistance was overcome by reasonable apprehension of serious bodily harm induced by threat 
or show of force on the part of the male. In order then for the state to be entitled to a verdict of guilty of that offense, you must conclude and be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant party was present and that he did commit that offense as defined to you by the accomplishment of sexual intercourse, the having of carnal knowledge of the female by the use of force and over her consent, that is without her consent. Further commenting on the element then of force in the commission of the offense, the law refers by this element to such force as is sufficient to overcome the resistance of the female person. The required force then is that by which a dissenting female is subjected to and put under the power of the male so that he is not able, notwithstanding her lack of consent or opposition to have sexual intercourse with her. Such force in the law may be either actual occurrence of physical violence or constructive. Okay, and so we have um, reasonable is just RNL, reasonable RNL. You have uh, sufficient SUF, SUF further is FURT circumstances. You can write in one stroke SIRKZ, SIRKZ. You've got nature is n long a f p nature n long a f p okay and this is going to be at 190 okay and the principal i'm talking about is prince pal the main okay and this is at 190 jury charge Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this indictment now embraces those offenses of assault and battery of a very high and aggravated nature. Obviously, if you conclude the state satisfied you of any offense in this category, then the defendant party, these are alternative offenses. Again, the defendant party could only be found guilty of one offense within this category, either the principal offense of rape or the lesser included offense of assault with intent to ravish or the third lesser included of assault of a high and aggravated nature. First then, defining the offense of rape. The legislature of the state has enacted a statute which basically simply restated the common law, our traditional law, on the subject in this language. Whosoever shall ravish a woman when she did not consent either before or after or ravished a woman with force shall be deemed guilty of rape. The word ravish, the word rape, as used in the statute are synonymous terms. Both describe the same offense and that offense is the unlawful taking of carnal knowledge of a woman forcibly and without her consent. The words carnal knowledge means the same thing as sexual intercourse. Consequently, the offense of rape is the accomplishment unlawfully that is without lawful right or authority, and this would occur if the other elements of the offense are made out. The elements of force and absence of consent, rape then is the unlawful accomplishment of sexual intercourse male against female forcibly and without the consent of the female. Now, there obviously cannot be carnal knowledge unless there is a penetration of the male organ into the female organ. Proof of any penetration, however slight, would be sufficient to make out this element of the offense. Carnal knowledge is accomplished by penetration. The state does not have to prove as an element of the offense any emission of semen. There must be, however, an actual penetration to some extent of the male organ into the sexual or genital female organ, but penetration, however slight, would be sufficient. Now then, the further elements of such act of sexual intercourse or having of carnal knowledge be shown to exist the further elements then to make out the offense are the following, that such act of carnal knowledge or sexual intercourse was accomplished by force and without the consent of the female against her will. In order then to constitute rape, the carnal knowledge must have been accomplished by force on the part of the male sufficient to overcome resistance offered by the female. Mere accusation on the part of the female would be insufficient. Proof of actual resistance is sufficient to a conviction of the offense unless it be shown that a female was either incapable by reason of some present physical condition of resisting or unless it be shown that she yielded herself through reasonable apprehension of imminent and serious bodily harm induced by threat or threats of show of force on the part of the male. The importance then of resistance by the female person is to show the use of force by the male and the element of non-consent on the part of the female. The sufficiency of resistance offered must of course be adjudged 
in the light of the surrounding circumstances as you find those to be, such as the relative strength and position of the parties, age, physical conditions, and what you find to be any degree of force to have been manifested or used in the way of threat of exertion of force by the male person. In the law, a female need not resist until her strength or consciousness is gone. The requirement of resistance by her would be satisfied when her conduct as or has been such as to make her non-consent and her actual resistance manifest or her status being that of being overcome by threat or show of force on the part of the male. Summarizing then, the offense of rape consists basically of three elements, three things of fact. First, the occurrence of the act of carnal knowledge, act of sexual intercourse. Secondly, that force was used by the defendant to accomplish that purpose. And third, that this was done without the consent and over the resistance of the female or that her resistance was overcome by reasonable apprehension of serious bodily harm induced by threat or show of force on the part of the male. In order then for the state to be entitled to a verdict of guilty of that offense, you must conclude and be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant party was present and that he did commit that offense as defined to you by the accomplishment of sexual intercourse, the having of carnal knowledge of the female by the use of force and over her consent, that is, without her consent. Further commenting on the element then of force in the commission of the offense, the law refers by this element to such force as is sufficient to overcome the resistance of the female person. The required force then is that by which a dissenting female is subjected to and put under the power of the male so that he is able, notwithstanding her lack of consent or opposition, to have sexual intercourse with her. Such force in the law may either be actual occurrence of physical violence or constructive force, the degree of force and the degree of resistance being elements to be found by you from your judgment of the circumstances of the case, but it again being necessary that you find beyond a reasonable doubt that there did occur the act of sexual intercourse that such was committed with the use of force by the defendant to accomplish that purpose and that that was done without the consent of the female person and either over her resistance or that any resistance was overcome by reasonable apprehension of serious bodily harm or by show of force on the part of the male. That's tough. Okay, and we'll now get ready for your tests, okay? We'll get ready for your tests. Okay, so we have your test number one, jury charge, and it says no proper names, okay? No proper names. This is gonna be test number one, jury charge, for five minutes. Make it a little bit bigger for the test. Okay. One, 80 jury charge number one test. You may reject the whole testimony of a witness who willfully has testified falsely as to a material point unless from all the evidence you believe the probability of truth favors his or her testimony in other particulars. You are not bound to decide an issue of fact in accordance with the testimony of a number of witnesses, which does not convince you as against the testimony of a lesser number or other evidence which appeals to your mind with more convincing force. You may not disregard the testimony of the greater number of witnesses merely from caprice, whim, or prejudice, or from a desire to favor one side against the other. You must not decide an issue by the simple process of counting the number of witnesses who have testified on the opposing sides. The final test is not in the relative number of witnesses, but in the convincing force of the evidence. Evidence of the character of a witness for honesty or truthfulness may be considered in determining his or her believability. You should give the testimony of a single witness whatever weight you think it deserves. Testimony by one witness which you believe concerning any fact is sufficient for the proof of that fact. You should carefully review all the evidence upon which the proof of that fact depends. Evidence has been received for the purpose of showing the good character of the defendant for those traits ordinarily involved in the commission of a crime such as that charged in this case. Good character for the traits involved in the commission of the crimes charged may be sufficient by itself to raise a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of a defendant. It may be reasoned that a person of good character as to such traits would not be likely to commit the crimes of which the defendant is charged. If the defendant's character as to certain traits has not been discussed among those who know him, 
you may infer from the absence of this discussion that his character in those respects is good. However, evidence of good character and certain traits may be refuted or rebutted by evidence of bad character for those same traits. Any conflict in the evidence of defendant's character and the weight to be given to that evidence is for you to decide. Where on cross-examination a witness is asked if she has heard of reports of certain conduct of a defendant inconsistent with the traits of good character to which the witness has testified, these questions and the witness's answers to them may be considered only for the purpose of determining the weight to be given to the opinion of the witness or to her testimony as to the good reputation or character of the defendant. These questions and answers are not evidence that the reports are true and you must not assume from any, you must not assume from them that the defendant did in fact conduct himself inconsistently with those traits of character. A confession is a statement made by a defendant in which he has acknowledged his guilt of the crimes for which he is on trial. In order to constitute a confession, the statement must acknowledge participation in the crimes as well as the required criminal intent or state of mind. An admission is a statement made by the defendant which does not by itself acknowledge his guilt of the crimes for which the defendant is on trial, but which statement tends to prove his guilt when considered with the rest of the evidence. You are the exclusive judges as to whether the defendant made a confession or an admission, and if so, whether that statement is true in whole or in part. Evidence of an oral admission or evidence of an oral confession or an oral admission of the defendant not made in court should be viewed with caution. No persons may be convicted of a criminal offense unless there is some proof of each element of the crime independent of any confession or admission made by him outside of this trial. The identity of the person who is alleged to have committed a crime is not an element of the crime, nor is the degree of the crime. The identity may be established by a confession or an admission. A witness who has special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education in a particular subject has testified to certain opinions. Any such witness is referred to as an expert witness in determining what way to give any opinion expressed by an expert witness you should consider the qualifications and believability of the witness, the facts or materials upon which each opinion is based and the reasons for each opinion. An opinion is only as good as the facts and reasons on which it is based. If you find that any fact has not been proved or has been disproved, you must consider that in determining the value of the opinion. Likewise, you must consider the strengths and weaknesses of the reasons on which it is based. You are not bound by an opinion. Give each opinion the weight you find it deserves, you may disregard any opinion if you find it to be unreasonable. In examining an expert witness, counsel may ask a hypothetical question. This is a question in which the witness is asked, and then you've got number two, 180 jury charge, Mr. Bacchus, Mr. Dunn, Jason Dunn, Kenneth Backus. And this is going to be 180. Jury charge starts in the middle, number two, for five minutes. Bodily injury. You will hear the judge when he's charging you. You will hear him define bodily injury as the impairment of physical condition or substantial pain. You see Mr. Backus's physical condition today, and you saw Mr. Backus's impaired physical condition. Mr. Backus also testified to the pain. He testified that he had a concussion and was out of work for three days. The next crucial theme is theft. The judge will charge you again. He will define theft. He will define it as the unlawful taking of movable property of another with the intent to deprive the rightful owner. Well, Mr. Backus testified that he never gave his wallet. He never gave his wallet to Mr. Dunn. He doesn't have it now. It's never been returned to him. Theft is something that we all have to take a look at at the facts to determine if a theft took place. Mr. Backus is without his wallet, without his money, and without his belongings. They are two items that will run parallel with each one of the crimes charged. He is charged with simple assault, attempt to cause bodily injury. Well, I submit to you that Mr. Dunn did far more than attempt to cause bodily injury. You don't need me to tell you that. You just have to take a look at the photos 
again, to show that bodily injury occurred. There is also a simple assault charge, bodily injury caused. Again, the photos and everything I just explained go to that charge. Not only did Mr. Dunn attempt to cause bodily injury, he did cause bodily injury, and he did so in a manner that was not justified. You have to ask yourselves whether Mr. Dunn was justified in using force. He states that he was using force to protect himself because Mr. Backus pushed him. Mr. Backus, who never met the man, never met Mr. Dunn, never spoke to him, never had any problems with the man, out of the blue comes up and pushes Mr. Dunn. That's something you're going to have to decide in this case. Was Jason Dunn justified in using force? If so, if you find that he was justified, that he was only using force because Mr. Backus initiated this contact, Mr. Backus started this fight, and he was only using force to protect himself, then you must determine was that force necessary? Was that force in excess of the amount of force that was necessary? Again, I submit to you that those photos speak for themselves. Jason Dunn is also charged with robbery. I want to refer to something only because I want to be exact. I don't want to tell you something that is not true. The defendant was charged with robbery. In this case, taking or removing property by force and the judge will charge you and you will hear the judge's definition that robbery, to be convicted of robbery, there must be proof that the defendant physically took or removed property from Kenneth Backus with force, however slight, and that the defendant so acted in the course of committing a theft, physically took the property of Kenneth Backus by force, however slight, and I submit to you that the force was not, however slight, and he did so in the course of committing a theft. He did so while he was trying to take the wallet. Again, he is also charged with another count of robbery. The defendant inflicted bodily injury upon Kenneth Backus, and he did so in the course of committing the theft. You can see that all the charges have a common theme, bodily injury, as well as in the course of committing a theft. There has been no testimony to contradict the injuries sustained by Kenneth Backus, no testimony whatsoever to contradict that. Those photos and his testimony of missing work due to a concussion, his testimony that he went to the hospital because of this incident, all of those go towards bodily injury. Now the theft. Did he take the property of Kenneth Backus unlawfully with the intent of depriving him? You see, that is why I concentrated on the bodily injury and the theft because they run in every one of those definitions that you will hear. And when you evaluate the testimony you heard today and yesterday, and you evaluate your verdict, you're to take into account your own life's experience. You have to bring in your common sense to find out what happened here. You bring all this in and you add to it the alibi defense and the self-defense, and I believe that you will arrive at a conclusion. And I submit that you will arrive at the conclusion that the defendant, Jason Dunn, is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The last comment I want to make is about reasonable doubt. You will hear the judge define what a reasonable doubt is. May I submit to you that every one of you knows what a reasonable doubt is. Now, it's not a doubt beyond any doubt. I will give you a hypothetical. When you go to purchase a house, and purchasing a house is probably the biggest purchase anyone will ever make in their life. Now you go and you pick out this one house that you're very interested in purchasing, but you have a doubt as to, okay, and then now we'll get ready for your 160s. On your 160, number one, we have some proper names. City of Boise, you have County of Custer, State of Idaho, Irwin T. Dant, Patrick and Lorraine Lansing, Sioux Street. And it's burglary and sexual assault. This is going to be 160 jury charge number one for five minutes test. Members of the jury, the information in this case charges that on the 8th day of July 1986 at the city of Boise, County of Custer, state of Idaho, the defendant Irwin T. Dant committed the crime of second degree burglary against the dwelling of Patrick and Lorreen Lansing, located at 1249 Sioux Street. To this charge, the defendant Irwin T. Dant has pleaded not guilty 
and these are the issues you are now called upon to decide. The information is a mere accusation against the defendant and it is not in itself any evidence of the guilt of the defendant. Further, no juror should permit himself or herself to be influenced to any extent, however slight, against the defendant because or on account of the filing of the information. You have been chosen and sworn as jurors in this case to try the issues of fact presented by the allegations in the complaint by the plaintiffs and the answer thereto of the defendants. You are to perform this duty without bias or prejudice as to any party. Our system of law does not permit jurors to be governed by sympathy, prejudice, or public opinion. Both the parties and the public expect that you will carefully and impartially consider all the evidence in the case, follow the law as stated by the court, and reach a just verdict regardless of the consequences. While the statutes of this state provide that a person charged with crimes may testify in his own behalf, he is under no obligation to do so. And the statute expressly provides that the defendant's election not to testify shall not create any presumption against him. And in this case, the election of the defendant not to testify should not be taken or considered by the jury as any evidence of his guilt or innocence. Statements and arguments of counsel are not evidence in the case. They are only intended to assist the jury in understanding the evidence and the contentions of the parties. During the course of the trial, it often becomes the duty of the lawyers to make objections and for the court to rule on them in accordance with the law. The jury should not consider or be influenced by the fact that such objections have been made whether they were sustained or overruled. Generally speaking, there are two types of evidence on the basis of which you may properly decide each issue in this case. One is direct evidence, testimony by a witness to a particular fact. The other is indirect or circumstantial evidence, proof of a chain of circumstances which point toward a particular fact. As a general rule, the law draws no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence, but simply requires that you decide each issue in accordance with a preponderance of all the evidence in the case, both direct and circumstantial. The statutes of this state provide that drunkenness shall not be an excuse for any crime or misdemeanor unless such drunkenness be occasioned by the fraud, contrivance, or force of some other person or persons for the purpose of causing the perpetration of an offense. But you are instructed, nevertheless, that you may consider whether or not at the time of the alleged second-degree burglary of a dwelling, the defendant was under the influence of any intoxicating liquor to such an extent as to be utterly incapable of forming any intent to commit the crime of sexual assault. Now, if you find that at the time he was so under the influence of intoxicating liquor as to be utterly incapable of forming the intention to commit the aforementioned offense, or if upon a consideration of all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt with reference thereto, you will find the defendant not guilty of second degree burglary of a dwelling. However, Drunkenness is not an excuse for the general criminal intent crime of first degree criminal trespass unless you find the drunkenness by occasioned by the fraud, contrivance, or force of some other person or persons for the purpose of causing the perpetration of an offense. A person commits the crime of second degree burglary of a dwelling if he knowingly enters or remains unlawfully in a dwelling with the specific intent to commit therein the crime of sexual assault. The elements of second degree burglary of a dwelling are therefore one knowingly two enters or remains unlawfully three in a dwelling four with specific intent to commit sexual assault if after considering all of the evidence you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant erwin t dant acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place and it continues, okay? 160 number two, it says no proper names, you all. This is gonna be 160 number two, test for five minutes, jury charge. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
the issues you are asked to decide are complex. This matter falls under the statutory heading as common law privilege and in this case to detain for investigation. The defendant in this case has a strong affirmative defense and you should pay close attention to these instructions. The written instructions will be sent to the jury room with you for your perusal. May I state that you are not to write or deface the written instructions in any manner as they are part of the court record. Any questions you may have about the instruction should be written, given to the bailiff and he will tender the question to me. It may be necessary to bring you back into the courtroom for further instructions at that time. As to the common law privilege, the defendant is not liable to the plaintiff on the claim of false arrest if the affirmative defense or a privilege to detain for investigation has been established. This defense is considered to be established if you find all of the following elements. One, the defendant was actually the owner of a business. Two, the defendant believed and in addition had reasonable grounds to believe the plaintiff had wrongfully taken merchandise or he had failed to make arrangements for payments or for the payment of the merchandise he received. Three, the defendant detained the plaintiff solely for the purpose of questioning him about the matter. Four, the defendant questioned the plaintiff in a reasonable manner and only for a reasonable period of time. And five, the plaintiff was in the place of business or had just left and was in the immediate vicinity. The defendant is not in a position of liability to the plaintiff on his claim of false arrest if the affirmative defense of privilege to defend person or privilege to defend property is established. The elements of establishing this defense would include an action by the defendant to restrict the plaintiff's freedom of movement and the defendant reasonably believed the plaintiff intended to inflict bodily harm upon his person or upon the person of another. You are to consider whether such restriction of the plaintiff's freedom of movement was reasonably imposed under the circumstances to prevent the plaintiff's actions. Consider too the length of time of the restriction or the seriousness of the threatened harm to or the interference with the defendant's person. Consider also the seriousness of any harm that might result the, to the plaintiff from the restriction. As an example, ladies and gentlemen, did the defendant use a confinement to defend his person or property, which would have been a force that would inflict death or serious bodily injury? Did the defendant use such confinement after he first requested the plaintiff to desist? These are questions for you to decide. Further, the defendant is not liable to the plaintiff on his claim of false arrest if the affirmative defense of a privilege to arrest without a warrant is established and you find that such privilege privilege, if any, was not abused. For instance, was the plaintiff at the time of the claimed arrest engaged in the act of committing a criminal offense? Was the criminal offense in the presence of the defendant and the defendant arrested the plaintiff for that offense? You heard testimony to that effect from the witness stand and it is your duty to determine if those elements existed. The evidence in the case consists of the sworn testimony of all the witnesses, all exhibits which have been received in evidence and all facts which have been admitted or stipulated. You are to consider only the evidence in the case and the reasonable inferences therefrom. An inference is a deduction or conclusion which reason and common sense lead the jury to draw from all of the facts which have been proved. We had several stipulations offered in evidence during the trial. When the attorneys on both sides stipulate or agree as to the existence of a fact or a fact has been admitted, you as the jury must regard that fact as conclusively proved. Any finding of fact you make must be based on probabilities and not based on possibilities. Do not base your finding of fact on conjecture, speculation, or surmise it to be a fact. A defendant under our system of law is not bound to give testimony in his defense. This defendant chose to take the stand and give testimony. You must not be prejudiced by the fact that he did take the stand just as you would be obligated to show no prejudice if he chose not to take the stand. The court admitted certain evidence for a limited purpose. You were instructed at that time not to consider this evidence 
and capitalize court when you can replace judge in the sentence, okay? That's it, you all have a great day. Uh, tomorrow we'll reconvene with Q&A, okay? Have a great day, you all. Type one up, see how you're doing.